You're not you're not only an architect, you're getting into music. Yeah, well, I've always liked music. I've like as in the drums, play the drums, not amazingly, but I can play them. I can read drum music kind of. Mm. Um and always enjoyed singing cuz dad was in a band from like the age of well, he's been playing guitar since he was 14, been in a band like his whole life. So music is a big part of everything. Ooh, picked up that now. Do you <laughs> See, it picks up everything but, but not like it's they're good enough where they won't pick up background noise paris who are you what are you doing here what am i doing i don't know is this like is this already recording now yeah whatever oh, we're just talking just sorry, imagine recording. we're catching up yeah but there happens to be a, good a mic chat. Like, it's always a good chat always always a good chat. that's why we're here <laughs> we're just here to have another good chat but like what's good about this is it locks you in mm. and that the headphones lock you into the conversation where if you just take these off you, you can, huh, there's all this background noise. That's and st- true, actually. You become a lot less immersive. And yes. Suddenly you're immersed. Exactly. I am immersed. This is, you know, an immersive experience. It is. The podcast. It's very multisensory, I'd say. Yeah. It's highly a sensory experience. It's like, um, anyway, I could elaborate about the headphones, but that is not <laughs> <laughs> That's how much you love the, the headphones. my life is just like suddenly a tangent. It's like, let's go into a lot of detail on that one thing. How do you say your last name, speaking of tangents? Uh, well, that's actually a good question. My whole life, my sister and I have been saying Triantis, but every time someone reads our surname, we say they say Triantis. And in Greek, it's actually Trianti, so it makes sense it should be Triantis. So basically, you don't know. We have not been saying our own surname <laughs> right our whole lives. So there's three different variations. We're going to roll with one of them. So Triantis is the one, I'd okay. say. I'd say it's proper. Have you been to Greece? I have. I went in 2019 with my sister, just oh, in wow. time. What was that like? It was really nice. I went to, I would have loved to have gone to more places, mm. but we went to um, Athens, mm. which was really, really cool. Very like, I liked Athens because it was more like grungy, a bit more graffiti, street art. It was very cool. But a lot of people who would go to Athens are like, oh, it's like overrated. But I think it's because they're expecting something very traditional. And there is like the beautiful architecture, ancient architecture from ancient Greece. Like there, of course, the Parthenon, but it's modernized quite a lot in, in Greece, uh, in Athens anyway. And then other parts of Greece were a bit more like Greek. Like um, we went to Lefkada, which is this really beautiful beach town. And we also went to Corfu, which is also called Gedgeda. And that was really beautiful too. But I think the French colonised it for a bit. So it's very French. And they um, wrecked it. Yeah. Oh, no. They, they made really pretty buildings. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> well, it was very French-inspired buildings. or very like, uh, okay. like very that kind of European-inspired buildings. So when you go there, it doesn't feel like – it doesn't look like Greece. It doesn't feel like it, but it, it's really – I don't know. It's an interesting part of Greece. But, um, but as soon as you walked in, you actually made like an uh, interesting point. You, you said something about the buildings that we don't appreciate that people go to your city and visit mm. and they're like these amazing like monuments. Mm. What were you saying? Yeah. So I don't know. I've thought about this a few times. Like I think like what you mentioned before as well, it's like, you know, we walk, we don't know what today is going to be super significant in the future. We don't really know. Like, when I say in the future, like uh, 200 years from now, 300, 1,000, like uh, we don't know, this room could be super significant for the, for some reason. Like it's timber from like the forests or whatever. It could have said because this podcast or one day, <laughs> yeah. you should just say the timber. <laughs> the architecture <laughs> this, in this me. Timbers. Like, <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I think it's, I mean, absolutely the podcast captured. Like, no, the it's history the timber. The compass. No, <laughs> it's timber. Too late done. now. Yeah. I, I dug the hole. Um, but no, like, you know, we don't know. It could be this building that ends up being really significant. Um, but I think it's like what you said, kind of as you live in a – nothing uh, – very few things feel super special in the context that you live in. It's that kind of like you look back and everything feels special because you can't visit that time. You look forward and it seems like all these exciting new things because you haven't seen it yet or accessed it yet. Yeah. And sometimes I think we find ourselves quite underwhelmed with the present day, I say generally speaking. Um, but there are still things I think that we can look at and objectively say, like, that's going to be quite significant. Like, I know that will be. For example, the Eureka Tower in Melbourne, that's probably going to be something that's seen as a engineering marvel because it was done ahead of its time, one of the tallest buildings for a little period of time in Melbourne. And we could probably say that that's going to be quite special, maybe, because it's so big, it's like monolithic, it's a focal point to a city. Um, but then there's things things that we probably come across day to day and we might utilise every day, which we think are very basic. But a uh, hundred years from now, it could be like, guys, like, you know, we've just uncovered, dug up some dirt, uncovered this thing. Mm. It could be a, a type of phone, which I will turn on silent. That would be awesome. <laughs> I so thought the, it was on silent. It pulls you. 
Yeah. That's the that's the dangerous things about phones because it pulls you from. That's why I love this is because yes. it locks you. But I'm going to use that as a point to then mm. interject because. When, you know, we walk past like the famous Flinders Street station, right? Mm. Y- you walk past like famous suburbs in Melbourne, like uh, Brunswick and the things that tourists will visit to feel the the uniqueness and the energy. And you realize a part of you realizes like, wow, that's, if you stop and pause, like, wow, mm. that's, that's pretty cool. Like it's that's quite nice. Yeah. yeah. Like it's beautiful. It's aesthetic. It's like, maybe you'd see like architectural um, inspiration or observations, but we take, we just walk past it usually, mm. almost always. Mm. But then I think about when we visit other cities, mm. well, we're then in the other position. We're the tourist mm. and the things that locals are doing, we used to do, but they just walk by the Empire State Building every day. And we're like, we got to go up. Yeah, they walk, go there. <laughs> right? But they're walking past it every day mm. or the whatever, the Christmas tree uh, in front of Rockefeller, which is mm. famous. Um, and all these like, oh, New York is very, my favorite city. Yeah, okay. It's top of mind. <laughs> I'm noticing things. I'm like, yeah, he likes New York. <laughs> yes, you can tell, right? And just that that's fascinating thing of perspective and how, I don't know, do you do you not appreciate it as much because you're, you see it every day? It becomes very familiar. Mm, mm. It's And I think it's a common point. I remember when I was much younger, I thought about how I always wanted a swimming pool as a kid. And I'd talk to people who had swimming pools and Same. they're like, we don't even use it. Re- they're like, you, you know, you don't even use a swimming pool. We have it. We don't use it that much. You're mm. not missing out on anything. And I was like, no, if I had it, I would be in it every day. But I think the novelty wears off. Like you'll get it. You'll be like every day, swimming pool, morning, afternoon, night. And then after a certain point, you're like, yeah, like we have a swimming pool. And it's, I think also just our brains once it's like oh, your brain only has so much space in it to always be amazed by something. Something can continuously amaze you for sure. But even the most amazing thing will eventually lose its novelty. And I think, like, there's also – we can't also, in the same breath as, like, wanting to appreciate things around us and still be amazed by what's around us, also not put too much pressure on ourselves to always be amazed. Like, it's okay sometimes, I think, to also be like, yeah, I do see that every day. And it's pretty cool, but I'm not going to focus on it every single day. Right, because you have your your life to live. live your life, exactly. So it's a fine line between – and I think this is the whole thing with mindfulness too. It's a fine line between being like too mindful, which is the point where you don't really actually live because you're too focused on having to focus mm. and then appreciating what's around you too. It's a fine balance. That's what I feel anyway. It's a fine balance. And, um, you know, by all means appreciate what's around you, but also like don't fixate on that too much because I feel like that can cause a lot of distress. Like I'm not focused enough. I'm not appreciating this enough just walking by something and just existing is enough as well. That's interesting. It's almost like a counter to ultra mindfulness or a mm. counter to just the, the movement of we need to be more present. It's like, mm. that's like the other side of it that you don't hear much because we do seem to be very uh, non-present. Mm. Right. But that's, that's important too. the other side. Mm. Have you heard of the hedonic set point? It does sound very familiar. So it's uh, this It sounds like what you're describing, this adaptation that reduces the affective impact of emotional events. Generally, hedonic adaptation involves happiness set point where humans generally maintain a constant level of happiness throughout their lives despite events that occur to them. And this applies to money Mm. as where you adapt to this new baseline of finances. Mm. Oh, I make $100,000 now. That's amazing. I used to be poor. Yeah. And then it's normal. Then it's only 100,000 is poor. Right. <laughs> or, or you doesn't stimulate the same amount of emotion mm. Mm. and you develop a new baseline, mm. which is not that much higher than what it was before. <laughs> it's, um, no, it's a, it's a really, I think it's a key thing. And I guess it's a good thing. And it's also, it also can be a bad thing. I think you can either... As humans, we like to always challenge ourselves. So we always like to have a problem to solve. So mm. as soon as we solve something, we're like, God, that was hard. I couldn't do it again. And then suddenly a new problem comes up and we're like, oh yeah, I'm doing it again. And it's because it's kind of exciting. There's a thrill. We like, we're curious, right? But then there's another point where it's the other side of that. So that's the, the pros of, of being like that. And the, the cons are that you go through this phase of never really being satisfied. And that's when you've got to, I think, that's when mindfulness can come in to reflect and be like, hang on, like, you know, yes, I'm aiming for the next goal and that's really, really good. However, you know, let's just check in and see how much have I achieved to date? You know, what have I done? When have I felt like, you know, 
most um, successful at what points and then to actually map those points out and be like yeah like that was awesome when I was in year five and got this little award that was such a good feeling you know I'm sure now that I'm getting five awards every month you know that doesn't mean much but that first one was a big deal and then you know oh yeah the first a hundred dollars I made when I got my first casual job god that was good so I think going back and, and realizing like it's like don't um it's like don't what's it called what's the word I'm looking for disregard the past you that was really happy with those achievements and don't think of it as though the past you is not important anymore because it's in the past like your achievements then are still just as important as the ones you're making right right now and the ones you're going to make and um I think sometimes you think oh that was the old me it doesn't really matter that was that was back then like Mm. just forget about that there was actually a good um image thing like photo series I saw on Instagram today and it talked about um, those pencils where like the little pencil thing would run out the top and you'd take it out and put it at the back to push a new pencil out mm. and it's kind of a good metaphor for what we're saying now which is like it's like you know the new pencil bit at the end sure that can help you write but that wouldn't have been able to have been pushed out if you did not put the old one in the back so it's like all the past versions of you uh, creating who you are today and you you wouldn't be here doing the things you're doing with the mind that you have and the experience you have if it wasn't for those past selves so celebrating those victories celebrating the awkward moments the mistakes all those things that have allowed you to be where you are and that will allow you to continue okay on the back of that then you just stimulated okay what's the pencil what's the most important like then the metaphor the most important biggest monumental pencil that has pushed you forward to put you in the position you are today Mm. like what's the one or one of the ones that is fundamental to where you are now i'd say i thought that yeah there's there's a lot of significant moments i think uh and by no means am i saying you have to go through hardship to like like you have to struggle all the time to to be better like sometimes you don't have to struggle and you can still be pretty good and that happens sometimes um, so by no means am I saying you like, you know, have to go through struggle to get something good because sometimes things work out well pretty smoothly. But for me personally, um, I've definitely learned a lot about myself and learned a lot about life generally through probably like uh, in like primary school, very early on, like prep, huh. which is like, you know, first for anyone who doesn't know what prep is, it changes interstate. They've got different words for it. Yeah, yeah. First year of primary school. Um yeah, I think like getting isolated a lot as a, as a young Greek girl who was, you know, just I guess back then things were a little still quite exclusive. Um, you know, I had to – sometimes my friends would run away like, and I'd still consider them my friends, I don't know, it's warped as. They would run away. So I'd be like, oh, what do I do now? I'm like, well, I guess I'll just have to make my own fun. And so I'd like go on adventures around the playground or like sing songs to myself, which sounds very sad but actually was very fun. <laughs> and um, – Make the best of a situation and it didn't – that situation I guess could have – doing that often could have, say, pushed me to be someone who refuses to engage with people in future in fear of being abandoned. But the way I took that lesson instead was I'm going to continue to put myself out there and and make friends and, you know, professionally successful – like, you know, personally, professionally put myself out there. But at the same time I know that if shit hits the fan – I also enjoy my own company. I can come back to ground zero and I'm okay. And I think that it's there's a lot of power and there's a lot of um yeah, there's a lot of power in knowing that yeah, if shit hits the fan, you're going to be fine and like you can you're happy to keep it, keep yourself company. You're okay with your own thoughts and you can sit there and be in that space for a little bit and then come back out with a new idea or a new plan. And um it's more like if those plans go well, you know, that's that's an addition to what's already quite good. So it's kind of like make sure making sure your foundation is really stable and making sure you're good. And maybe your say inner circle's good. And then anything else that comes on top of that is really a bonus. And if it goes well, it goes well. And if it doesn't, you can learn from it. I don't understand how you made it out to not uh for that not to affect every single meaningful relationship in your life. I know people uh close to me and not so close to me. Mm-hmm. And it's also obvious that that uh, somewhat traumatizing or, or some would say damaging upbringing of feeling maybe people would feel lonely, they would feel isolated. You took it one way. How did you do that and not let that fear of abandonment affect your relationships from the rest of your life? Or mm. did you for a period of time? Yeah, so I think, um, I guess 
for a little bit I did <laughs> you go through different phases in life and certain quotes I would tell myself at these different phases so as I grew up as I as I got older I think it was from the the angsty ages of like 13 till 17 my motto to myself was expect nothing and be pleased with me- mediocrity. And that was obviously during a time where I was going through a lot of friendship phases. That sounds very nihilistic. It was horrible. And I would tell people like, guys, you know, stop what you're doing. This is the way to live. <laughs> and they're like, what? And they're like, actually, that's pretty spot on. We're all angsty. So we all thought it was a great phrase to live by. And it got, I think someone once said to me, like they pulled me up and they said, that doesn't sound that good. I'm like, no, it's not very good, isn't it? <laughs> and um, it was, it's a, the lesson there though, it wasn't that that actually impacted how I engaged with people. I didn't sit there and be like, I expect nothing. Of course I expected something still. Deep down we all do. But um, I would just, uh, you set yourself up for failure first and then, you know, if it happens, oh, great. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. But if it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, wow, it didn't actually go that bad. It's, um, and I think a lot of the time, I'm glad that period of time didn't last too, too long. It was probably only for a year in hindsight that I was like in that headspace. But um I think the thing is with that headspace, yeah, it comes from a place of fear and it's a defence mechanism. And a lot of the time I think that we turn life lessons into negative things or, say, negative outputs um, is when we're coming from a place of fear and self-defence. And that's why I really think that, you know, um, you know, is there objective bad? Is there objective good? I don't know. Some people can just love doing things that are, are mean to other people. But a lot of the time I'd say more than 80% of the time, it comes from a place of fear and self-defence. The wor- the reason we push people away, the reason we might, say, hurt people. Yep. It's the classic, like, I'll hurt you before you hurt me. Or I'll actually hurt myself first by telling myself this isn't going to work. And then if that doesn't work, then I'm good. And um, and I think I've realised, say, during that time of having that horrible motto, um, that no, you know what, it's okay that I like to be nice to most people I interact with. It's okay that I like to have good conversations with strangers and everything. It's not about how much I'm putting out that is the reason why I get that people say have, have stopped being friends with me in the past. It's not because I've been nice to them. It's because they've just chosen that they don't want to be a friend or they just don't get along with me very well. And that's okay. Be accepting the fact that like what you put out there is not always going to be accepted in the way you want it to be is really, really freeing. And also makes you a more compassionate human because you're acknowledging the fact that everyone's living their own lives. They can choose which friends they want in their life just as you choose which friends you want in your life. So as, as, long as, as, as soon as you realise that you come at kindness and life lessons from um, it's this whole like scarcity versus abundance thing, you come at things with more of an abundance mindset where it's like I'm putting this out there and what I get back is great and what doesn't come back to me, that's fine too instead of being like, oh, I've got to be really particular about where I put this. In fact, I won't be nice to anyone anymore because, oh, in the past, you know, people have left. So you change your perspective. And I'm very much now okay with people saying no to ideas I have or no to wanting to catch up or, I don't know, no to being friends or things like that because that's okay. And they don't have to agree with everything that I want to do. I think that takes maturity Mm. and perspective Unfortunately, that perspective I don't think is that common. It's not that common. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, if I'm if I'm really honest, in my perspective, it's very uncommon. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like to have that amount of uh, how should I say, like to accept to not be that what you're putting out to the world not be received in a positive way, or to, or to even not take things emotionally. Mm. Right, that's that's like a muscle that you have to strengthen. Yeah, like a lot of people struggle with that, with how to strengthen that muscle of uh, being dispassionate. I don't know if you've heard of that word, mm. of like this emotional uh, detachment from the outcome. Mm. Not like you're a robot. No, but I guess in a part it comes of like a non expectation mm. of back to your early teenage mm. kind of self. Like there's something there. Mm. Mm. What were you going to say? No. <laughs> I was going to add on to that. And, like, I think, it, yeah, it, it can still go into that realm of, like, maybe it's coming from a lack of expectation. I think, though, it all comes to down, down to how you approach it. So I, I definitely approach the releasing control um, and releasing expectation. I approach it more from the, like, empathy and compassion for another human being. So it's, like, 
it's that whole thing. It's, I don't know. Everyone says like this whole main character thing now. It's like a buzzword. But everyone's mm-hmm. their own main character. It's this whole thing. It's like, oh, you know, you're the main character of your story. Oh. And it's like, I see it everywhere now. Oh, like you're the hero in your own movie? Yeah, kind of that same thing. It's that mentality of like you're seeing things through your eyes. You make decisions that benefit you kind of thing. Uh-huh. And um, But everyone's the main character in their own lives. So what does that mean? Everyone's going to make decisions that are out of your control. And empathy and understanding and compassion for the fact that we're all here just trying to live our lives and trying to make decisions that are in line with our best interests and with our directions. It just, you know, it would be very uh, be very selfish of me to always assume that people are going to react exactly how I want them to because I don't control people. And I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to control people. It's quite fun not knowing how someone's going to react. Like, well, what are they going to say? Right. <laughs> There's a level of, like... Uh, it's a level of like delusion to expect that, but I guess mm. we like control, right? Mm. So if we like control, then we'd want to control the outcome. And the one thing that we can't control, and what, what's been really challenging about the last couple of years, uh, if you read Lost Connections by, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name. The author who uh, describes uh, these main, I think, 12 root causes to depression. Mm. And one of them is a feeling of uncertainty in the future. Mm. Like there's a lack of control in the future, which many have experienced in the last couple of years, which which leads people to ill feelings. Mm. Uh, and it seems to be a, a precursor to depression mm. and anxiety. And so I think that's co- that's a connected part to that is this uncertainty of, well, some people are just not at peace mm. with not being in control. Mm-hmm. And that's, I guess that makes people feel... Uh, without saying out of control like (laughs) unhinged yes (laughs) yes and there seems to be a lot of unhinged people Mm. it's i suppose like you know i guess getting very existential about it life in itself is it is already something that we don't really understand like we do but it's also we're continuous life is kind of a mystery in, in many ways and so our brains are trying to like find all these little things that we can control and um right the realization that we don't control other people happens at different stages in people's lives i feel some it happens quite early on, some it happens later on, maybe sometimes it never happens and you think that you're literally a puppeteer, which has its own kind of like other issues. Um, but yeah, I think just because we already feel like we don't have much control, we try to grasp onto it as much as possible. But I mean, that's when you've got to make a realistic kind of, I guess, list of, you know, what are the things that are in my control? Oh, these things, what can't I control? How people react, how people will be. I, I don't have any control over that. And um in a very like logical way that's kind of you know one way um to approach it and um but the uncertainty thing sorry as you were talking it reminded me um another i guess i suppose an event that happened in my life where i had to be okay with uncertainty and it sounds very like this sounds very it's more like about career wise um when i did my honors year i did it um with this like part of some band called design factory and what did you do your honors in uh, does, it's in interior architecture, but design innovation focus. Yep. And we, the the pedagogy, the learning style there was design thinking, which is now what I lecture in and also work in. And that whole design thinking is all about knowing that we know nothing. So we went into this honours year being given projects and briefs where we had to kind of discover our own challenges that we wanted to solve, which is what research is usually about. But there was a lot of moments of uncertainty and we, you know, our lecturers were awesome and taught us how to navigate ambiguity, how to navigate uncertainty. And there's these tools and everything you can use, but essentially it's a mindset. It doesn't matter how many tools you have, it's a mindset change. Some of the students in our cohort were able to make that shift towards actually liking uncertainty and liking the fact that the answer wasn't known because it means there's opportunity. But others found that really tough and and actually really struggled. And, um, you know, we, we did a lot of research at this um, nuclear physics institute called CERN in Switzerland. And they talked to us about like the fact that everything, space is uncertain. And some people just lost their minds with that kind of, (laughs) but you know, with myself and a few others were like, yeah, like, you know, it's flipping the perspective of like, you know, instead of saying I know nothing and that scares me or there's no answer and that scares me, like that really scares me being like, well, I know what I know and I can know more. And then also there's no answer, which means anything can be the answer at this point. And it's looking at things from um, the lens of like there is optimal opportunity 
rather than like what do you mean by that just like that you know you can kind of explore anything not knowing what the outcome is going to be of something means you still have control over that outcome or you have control over the, the direction you'll take and um there should be you can you can change your mindset to have like excitement over the unknown it's kind of like if you're i don't know say a daredevil and you're on a roller coaster you've been on before Every dip is exciting because you've never done it before. The second time you're like, oh yeah, the dips. <laughs> you're familiar. Yeah, but the but you know people who love roller coasters, I personally don't. But people who do would would argue you're the a first crazy time. Crazy person. <laughs> well, I was. Do you like roller coasters? No, that's like those are crazy people. <laughs> I have to force myself, like as a like I really like. I've avoided them most of my life, and then yeah. I was in Singapore. I'm gonna take a detour here uh, at yeah. Universal Studios, and um, I was uh, I was with. Uh, with a group of people and then one time I was with my girlfriend and we were I'm like okay she loves them okay <laughs> she went on like the craziest one but before we did we kind of worked our way up I just I just made a decision you are scared of this you're gonna do it right and I think on the other side like Will Smith said on the other side of fear you can't see beauty if you're scared mm. you can't experience beauty or the full experience of something if you're fearful like I remember being on like tall bridges in Vancouver and it's like a hundred foot drop. Mm. And I'm like, this like some <laughs> rickety old, you know, bridge thing. Um, and the roller coaster and, and, and we did it. And you, you're, it's the overcoming mm. of the fear mm. that gives you a bit more confidence in yourself. Mm. Absolutely. Self improves your self efficacy, mm, mm. even in something as like I don't know, silly as like a roller coaster, but it's a symbol, it's what it represents, absolutely. And, and you know, everyone's got varying degrees of, um, you know, I guess what a challenge is, depending on what your benchmark of a challenge is. Like we were saying before with that graph, it's like you might find something really challenging, but then you encounter something else, you're like, no, that was actually really easy. This is now my challenging. That's my that's my new benchmark. And, um, you know, so for some people it might be like going on a roller coaster is the thing that they're super scared of and they do it and they're like, oh, like I feel so good. For someone else it could be answering the phone is really scary. They've never done it. They, at mm. work they will avoid it, you know. And then one day they're like, you know what, I've got my script. <laughs> I know exactly how I'm going to answer the phone. Deep breath. It's a two-minute conversation. They do it. They're like, that actually wasn't that bad. And they've done it and they like they feel amazing. So it's kind of like whatever works for you, you know, what thing do you need to overcome personally to make you feel more capable? Yeah. It's, um, and we all do. Yeah. We all have something. Absolutely. I, I, I went to the scenic railway at, uh, <laughs> at Luna park, uh, yeah. beginning of 2019. My friends were like, that's not even that scary. And I'm like, I was crying on it. <laughs> I was like, for the first 15 seconds, I was like, why did I do this? Why am I on this? Get, get me, me off. off. I, right. I was like, get me off. I looked at the lady. I was like, get me off. <laughs> I don't want to be here. And um, she was looking at me like, just like you're stuck on the ride. What are you going to do? And I had to just release all control. I was like, I actually, I've made the decision to yeah. go on here because yeah. I was a little bit tipsy and I said, yes, <laughs> I was feeling a little more courageous. I yeah. went on and then I was like, God damn, I'm on here. But eventually I just kind of was like, well, I guess I'm just going to keep screaming. And then eventually I had fun and I wanted to go on again, yes. but they closed it. I was That's like, right. And it's, um, Strange. I probably wouldn't go on a crazy one like the Superman or Scooby-Doo ride apparently, which is very scary. Um, but I, I wouldn't go on those, but doing what I did for me, that scenic railway, which the word scenic in itself tells you how scary it is. Um, that for me was a big one. But for me, I think, you know, my personal challenge is that my benchmark is going through emotional challenges. Like, that stuff for me has been what's shown me okay. my strength. But for others, it's something different. And um, but there is a confidence that comes from every hardship you work yourself you work yourself through. Mm. Um, and it and it um, the more you learn that you're more capable than you think you are, the more confidently you will enter uncertainty and you'll enter ambiguity. And you might actually look for it. Event like eventually, you might actually look for situations where people are saying, "We don't know what to do here." And then you're like, well, that's my sweet spot. That's where I actually thrive. And then you're the person people come to when they don't know things. And it's a nice shift. Because you, you, you kind of learn and realize and make an association that fear and uncomfortable things is like a gateway to progress mm. and a better version of yourself on the other side. Mm. But what you have to overcome is the apprehension, is the fear, which mm. is like a big resistance. Mm. 
but if you if you can start to create positive associations like in your brain with like okay positive associations with discomfort like you might do when you exercise mm. like l- literally um it might sound strange to people uh but telling yourself you're enjoying something that is physically uncomfortable mm. <laughs> actually has a positive effect on secreting more dopamine and creating a po- more positive association to increase the wanting and liking for you to do it again. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you can almost hack your dopamine, no, dopaminergic system by your self-talk. Yeah, absolutely. Language is a, is a huge thing and the way we talk to ourselves as well. And um, yeah, there, there's definitely been like times... And I think it's, you know, knowing when to do it in the right time. You know, if you're, if you're actually having a really horrible time and say it could be, I think almost uh, when it comes to personal, so I'm going to just jumped around there. Firstly, when it comes to personal things that you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to get a better personal best on a run or you're trying to um, go on a roller coaster and you just want to do it for yourself because you find it really scary, you want to just get it done. Those things are when you tell yourself, you know what, it's it's great that I feel this way. Yeah. Like, this is awesome. I'm going to do something new. Like, I can't wait to, to do this and then afterwards I'm going to feel fantastic. Even if you feel the opposite in the moment. Absolutely. Like kind of lie to yourself. You lie to yourself yeah. a little bit. You yeah. can. Yeah. You can do it. It kind of it works. You, yeah, sometimes brains are stupid and you tell your brain that it's stupid and it believes you a little bit sometimes. That's right. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. But then other times where you, <laughs> you shouldn't do that is when – someone's treating you horribly and you're sure. like, don't tell yourself that that's a good thing. That's when you go to yeah. tell yourself. It's, but then, you know, the discomfort there is maybe I'm so scared to tell that person that they're treating me horribly. I'm too scared to say that. But actually tell yourself, it's gonna, you know what, it's going to be great to tell them that because afterwards they're going to know. So you can change the perspective there. It's like either I keep feeling horrible and just uncomfortable or I feel better, like I have five seconds of discomfort and then I immediately feel better afterwards. I find that so interesting. You said five seconds of discomfort. It made me feel like, you know when people eat foods that they know make them feel a bit shit, mm. right? You know, they eat, it's Christmas, New Year's. Like yeah. they eat the whole cake or they eat <laughs> half the cake and maybe they don't respond well to gluten or they know they bloat when they eat dairy, right? Mm. But they know it tastes so good. It's so delicious. Right? <laughs> and it's like we want 60 seconds, two minutes of mouth pleasure, mm. but we mess ourselves up for the next 24, 48 hours. <laughs> Like two minutes mm. of mouth pleasure because mm. we're addicted mm. and we screw up the next couple of days. Yeah. Well, yeah. What are we doing? We're just chimps. I know. And it's and it's like both things are true. You can either say that, oh, it's worth it for the outcome because it's so nice right now or it's worth it for the out- from the outcome. The outcome's going to be great and mm-hmm. it's worth the discomfort now. So it's like the opposites. And I think sometimes the, the first one, eating the cake even though – Say, let's say eating the cheesecake, even though you're lactose intolerant, right. is short-term gratification. Yes. Um, having a tough conversation because you know it's going to benefit uh, yourself afterwards is long-term gratification. That's it. And going for a run, it's never good straight away. It's Unless you're in a really good mood. Then you're like, oh, yeah, this is great. And then <laughs> you're like, oh, no, it's wearing off. Um, but, you know, it's the same thing. It's that short – it's long-term gratification. And I think it's – it's okay to enjoy short-term gratification too. Like don't rob yourself of that. Sometimes you want to have like a lolly. It's like, oh, it's so nice, you know, or moderation, right? Um, but the long-term gratification, the more you train yourself to endure that and to pursue it and achieve it, the more you want that. And it then, But you also know it doesn't happen overnight. So before you embark on a long-term gratification journey, you know the work that's going to go into it. But you do it because – it's been really good in the past. And I think that's a, that's a key thing. But it's, God damn, it takes, it's hard to be motivated. Even if you have experienced it before, to do it again, it's like, okay, oh, God, <laughs> this is going to be tough. And there's like, well, firstly, it made me think, I don't know, you may or may not agree with this, but there's my perspective and belief that some of the most successful people are successful because they are very good at delaying gratification mm. and not taking the short-term gratifying uh, immediate dopamine pleasurable behavior. Mm-hmm. They delay it. They they look at the future and they see that the current decision affects a future version of themselves. Mm. They have this great perspective between being able to identify with a 30-year-old, 40-year-old or next year version of themselves and the behaviors they do now actually will affect that. And it seems the people who have a less connected uh relationship with their future selves and can't see their future selves they're the ones who tend to 
take those short term gratifying pleasurable mm. acts. I read it in some psych from some psychologists and I thought it was quite profound. Mm. I think it's an excellent point. It's that whole thing of practicing foresight. You know, we're not fortune tellers. There's no such thing as a, a predictor or a person who can predict the future. But there are futurists, right? And what they specialize in is oh, looking right. at things that are happening now patterns. and potential trends and patterns. And the same thing can be applied to how we go about achieving things. It's like, you know, you look at your daily patterns, consistency. If you're not being consistent, you're probably not going to have that end goal. And if you have no end goals, well, you're going to have no consistency really because you're going to keep trying little things that make you feel good, but nothing's actually sticking. Um, that's something I'm trying to do even now, like is is kind of reassessing and reevaluating what are my long-term goals? Like there's a lot of things that I want to do, but what things are actually going to make future me um, feel feel really good and feel happy with where I'm at and um, at the same time as enjoying the journey in doing so. And that's a key thing. I think mm, I have an aversion towards goals. Mm. Um, not that they're not coming up be effective for some people, but because people only set goals and then that's it. That's, yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I think sometimes a more productive question to ask is what type of person do you want to become? Mm. Mm. What type of values do you want to uphold? Or what type of people do you admire? Mm. What type of lifestyle do you want? What type of freedom in your lifestyle do you uh, require and, uh, and desire? Mm. And you almost like work backwards with like what systems and habits then do you need? Mm. Rather than I think our society is very obsessive about the end, Absolutely. the outcome. I think it's a big... It's a big mistake. Mm. You get to the end. Now what? Mm. Mm -hmm. The game of life, the goal has to be, to me, mm. the goal has to be the process. It Absolutely. has to be the day to day. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what it's like. To, I don't know how many, God knows how many hours you put in to a lot of the architecture designs and, and paintings mm. that. I don't know if that was maybe they call them something differently. Yeah. Paintings that you've done. I don't know. Where do you go in your head when you're doing that work? Because you know you in front of you is maybe a 50, 100 hour. I don't yeah, know. It's How long? <laughs> it's a lot. It's what you say. It's the process. So you have to enjoy the process. And that's you have to enjoy what you're doing. So when it's an artwork, I'm not actually thinking about when it's done. I actually am sad about when it's done because the process right? is really fun. Yeah. That's when you can go in your head and oh, you just wow. zone out. And that's, I think, when you're doing something you enjoy, you're actually not worried. Like, the outcome can be anything. I mean, even with, with architecture and design, like, I would, a lot of the time, and I think I should maybe consider the form of the, what the thing looks like a bit more, but I would design more from an experience place because when I was researching people's experience, how they go through a building, the things I want them or I would like to facilitate them to do, um, I would design elements in architecture that did that, spatially and did that kind of through facilitation and it didn't matter so much about the color of the brick unless I was focusing on color as a psychological thing it would be more about the form of the wall where does it direct the person mm. and it's um the process is, is is what is enjoyable with painting it's the process and I think most artists unless they're focused on say a different type of goal with their artworks would agree that it is about the process and in the process is when you enjoy it most once it's done, it's done. It almost doesn't belong to you at the end. You're like, that's done. That's its own thing. And I don't know what's going to happen to that. But during it, you're discovering more about yourself. You're learning more about the subject matter. You might be learning more about your style. You might be thinking about everything at once as you're painting a brushstroke. And um, every time you look at that artwork, you remember that moment, maybe what you were thinking when you were doing that brushstroke, when you were painting that shape, when you mix that color, what was going through your mind. And you literally do things as you work through your thoughts, which is very good for the mind and I guess the same thing goes with goal setting it's if you're just focused on the goal that's not enough it's like going to the gym and saying I just want to look huge <laughs> and it's like well are you enjoying that process because if you're not well I'm going to tell you something mm. that that one is a maybe a bit of a, a different outlier example mm, true though some people do I don't know how many people I'm not really one of them mm. one th one thing actually one thing I do enjoy I genuinely enjoy is nature being outside and doing physical movement in nature mm. like there's something very like uh um i don't it feels good it feels better for sure you know like somewhere deep in my primitive brain mm. 
But it might sound strange. I want to be really honest with myself here. Mm. Like, do I enjoy training every day? I've been doing it for who knows how many years. I tell you with basketball, when I dedicated my life to, um, shortly before we met, mm. I would have come back from America. Um, yeah. And many years after, I realized I loved basketball, but it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. It might sound strange, but it wasn't fun at all to me. Mm. I realized like I was just obsessed with something mm. and I wanted to be great at something. It was, it was more about pursuing betterment and feeling useful in the world and feeling like I can be good at something in the world because previously I, I didn't feel that at all. Mm. And it was more about the person I was becoming rather than enjoying the moment in fact, even now with basketball and with exercise, weight training, sauna, running, whatever, I don't, I don't think I really enjoy it at all. And maybe that's sad to some people, mm. but I don't do it for enjoyment. Mm. I do it because I know I need to do this to become a certain type of person and I know every rep, every moment, every day of consistency gets me closer or not even closer, I'm just actualizing the type of person that I desire to be, mm. which just resonates with my values. Mm. So it's like a it's like a vote for the type of person that I wish to become and want to become. So it's not for me, and I observe from many other people, not everyone, it's not enjoyment. I mean, do you, maybe you have some thoughts on that, but do you really enjoy like 50, 100 hours of just details and just painting and, and in front of oh my god how long it must take you to design some of the work you do it takes a long time maybe maybe you love every moment or mo most of it i don't know it's um i think what you mentioned it's like um it's almost like a, obviously basketball is a big passion of yours but you could have been doing maybe uh, maybe even myself artwork i love painting but i could be doing any mundane thing if i can allow myself to think through the process and if i'm kind of feeling like personally the consistency is helping me develop and, you know, develop my, um, what's it called, determination, develop my perseverance, develop in my diligence yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, consistency, then obviously doing what I'm doing is important, but what's most important is knowing that I'm doing something that's um, meaningful for myself. Right. So with yourself, it could have been basketball, it could have been maybe another sport that you really enjoy too, but you're, you're, you're developing those like fundamental human skills that you would hope most of us get to develop. And it's um, it's that consistency. And what's that word I'm looking for? It's uh, de determination, diligence, um, when you do things. <laughs> you Describe do things. it. Um, when you do things consistently, when you're – I'm not going to be able to think of it. It's actually an interesting thing. The more you're trying to think of the thing you're trying to think of, your brain actually doesn't remember it. Mm. You need to talk about something else and then it will pop up. I heard in psychology is called tip of tongue theory, I think it's I called. I think that's what it is. Because if you go down the same track of or train of thought where you're not remembering it, you're actually going to keep remembering things that are not going to trigger the, the actual word. It's so interesting. Yeah. It's very, yeah. Our brains are crazy. <laughs> so uh, what? Resiliency, um, um, determination, it's consistency. Uh, it's a word. It's a word. It's a word. Um, then we can edit things out, by the way, if you, if you like. <laughs> That's like we can do that. Okay, cool. We'll like if you need to go to the bathroom word. or something, you need yeah, some yeah. water. Like you can just tell me. <laughs> There's a, there is a word. Um, there is a word. There are words. Determination. I don't know. It's probably not really that important. <laughs> it's what? It's probably not that important to remember the word. Okay, okay well, good. Six fifteen. I've just got uh, what's it called? Go to the gallery with my sister. Six fifteen. Well, but she lives in South Yarra. What time you got to leave? Probably like five thirty. Is that okay? Yes, whatever. Can I? Oh, oh, okay. What is it? <laughs> it's like some weird exchange. <laughs> Let's take that. <laughs> Only 5.30. Oh, we've got so much stuff to talk about. I know, I know. I know today's packed. Today's genuinely packed. But um, but no, I think as long as what you're doing, um, you know, is, is developing those core skills, then it feels like you're doing something meaningful. 
right now with the career I'm doing, I'm not doing something in architecture, but the work I'm doing feels really meaningful. It's contributing to the betterment of society through enhancing the way we go through like um, medical practices, the way we do things in the medical industry. And I'm using my design thinking to make that better. Can you explain this? Because I, I am not up to date. People <laughs> definitely have no idea. Can you explain what you do in a practical sense mm. and, and what things you're creating and designing out there in the world? Mm. So at the moment, um, so like I said, my honours was focused on using this whole theory of design thinking, which is a, a process of design, which amongst it has more design processes to solve challenges. It's like creative problem solving. So I did my honours in that and then after that got into lecturing and now I've been lecturing in that same topic for the past four years. And um, that's led into the position that I have now, which essentially I'm applying these skills of problem solving, design thinking, um, collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration to the medical field. So the government's put a bunch of funding into medical technology research in Victoria and the Swinburne MedTech Vic Hub is where I work and that's my role as design coach. So I'm collaborating or bringing people together from clinical allied health backgrounds and we want to see how their experience has been, like what do they need in their practice to allow them to um, better inform, say, digital health or assistive technology outcomes for patients. So at the moment there's like a gap between um, – there is a knowledge gap between the way, you know, say nurses, for example – go through their practice and the things they would recommend for their patients versus what gets produced at the end by, you know, technical assistive tech companies, assistive tech being enabling technologies like wheelchairs and things like that. And um, that disconnect costs a lot of money over time because it's a lot of wasted innovations. There's things that just don't really hit the mark for patients. And so through my, um, I guess, programs that are designed for the right people to have the right conversations, we can hopefully uncover what the real challenge is and potentially what the real solution should be by interacting with the right people and bringing the right people on board. So it's a, I guess it's a really broad way of explaining what I do, but there's a whole process to how that happens. And it's both a mix of using specific like um, tools and activities to get people thinking laterally and differently, and then also engaging in a mindset shift to allow people to be more okay with the ambiguity and be like, okay, this is what you think the problem is within your practice. But if we actually talk to these people, they'll tell you otherwise. Or if you think of it from this perspective, the problem actually is a bit deeper. So and you're um, leading yeah. the team or man helping manage the team rather than solving the actual problem, mm. designing the actual design. Mm, is that correct? Exactly. The design almost comes later on. Oh. It's like the design is okay. going to happen. The solution will happen. But it's more like the foundations of that solution. You know, the those like really important critical insights into you know we call it the use case but like the actual functions of what it needs to do who it's going to serve that's what's important and then what it looks like that part's the easy part almost the hard part is knowing exactly what people are actually going to want to use what's going to be user friendly um what will actually what's scalable you know it's not just good for now it's going to be good for a while all those things, it involves a lot of systems thinking, system mapping, future forecasting, back casting as well. So you're talking before about backtracking. We take, a, we take an event and we backtrack and we think what could have been done better. Okay. Or taking a stance being like, if we do this, what could happen in the future and all the different things that might happen. So by the end of that process, talking to the right people, engineers, IT people, lawyers, all those sorts of people, medical practitioners, by the end you've got such a well-informed solution that when it comes to the production and development of it, you've already tested mm. prototypes. You've already tested ideas with the right people. You're not going to produce something at the end where you put it out there and it's a complete waste of the millions of dollars that went into it. It's something that's been informed by many voices and over a, and it's marinated for a while and at the end it's good to go. And it's um, a, a more future-proofed design. And it's a whole thing as well with what I do. It's all about failing first and succeeding later. So every failure you do is failing forward. So we say failures, but really they're just little mishaps along the way that, you know, you try something and, oh, that, we learnt something from that. But you take that forward with you. And then if someone asks, well, why didn't you explore this? Well, we did. We tested it and not good. <laughs> this was the result. Um, and these are the metrics we measured it against. And for that reason, it didn't fit those metrics. Therefore, we put that aside. And um, you fail forward. 
And uh, it's a key thing. A lot of the people think you need to succeed first and then that's it. Success is the only option. Success comes after a lot of refinement. And it's like what you said before, short-term gratification will tell you that the first thing you design needs to be perfect because you want mm, it straight away. Perfectionist type of mentality. Yeah. But then uh, long-term gratification will tell you that the outcome is not really important, but the process. You need Your research needs to be good. You need to talk to the mm. right people. And even with yourself, the process, you need to know why you're doing this. You need to go through each little phase to make that end goal really rich and make it worth something. And, and it's like if, if you don't do that, you could, you could fluke it and it could be fine. You could be fine at the end. But there's probably something you overlooked that's going to come up later on and it's either in a professional sense going to cost you a lot of money or cost people their jobs or, you know, reputations is a big one. Or personally, it's going to cost you a lot of emotional labour because you didn't think about something that you should have thought of. And um, the mindset is huge behind what I do. And it's getting people to have that mindset is really hard, but you can do it. (laughs) I kind of train coaching people how to have that mindset. That's Because that's kind of an underpinning to a successful project. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what project are you working on now or what is the most exciting to you right now on your mind? It's, um, I, I can't really say too much about what we're working on currently, but we are working on essentially just... Sorry, no one's listening. <laughs> just, you can cut, cut this part out? It's just you and... No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if I need to, it's like yes. An NDA. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say broadly, it's, it's the coolest part of what I do at the moment is that any assistive technologies for people living with disability will be... Um, we'll be able to test out technologies that we'll basically be able to know if something's good before we put it on the market, which is great because we've got kind of technologies and stuff at Swinburne University where we can do that. We can, we can kind of test to see if things are going to be good for people before we actually get people to use them. And it's through some cool tech stuff that we've got. And okay. um, I think some stuff's been published, but I can, super, send, I can send you some things. Super secret tech stuff. Super secret tech stuff. <laughs> so then why did you do your master's? Why go ahead and you know, spend another one or two years, you know, thousands of hours, a lot of effort and energy and stress to do that. What was on the other side of that that you needed to go through? So the master's was a great lesson in resilience, especially finals, the thesis semester that was early last year. That was like three all-nighters a week. It was wild. Um, (laughs) It was a lot. uh, That's great for your health. It's Um, really good. uh, But there's a bigger mission at hand. Yes, exactly. What did you do your master's in? Architecture and urban design. Three all-nighters a week for a period of time. For a period of time, yeah. It was – so I definitely still want to go back into that field, but coming at it from my experience in the current position and that whole, like, mindset part, it's something that I think is actually missing from the architecture and design part is the people, is the thinking behind things before just doing. I think a lot of the time we just see buildings like, why? Like, why is it designed like that? And just kind of these shells – these empty shells. Do you think that a lot when you walk past buildings? Yeah, I do. And I think there's a lack of like, well, that's why I'm more interested in like the urban environments because it's where we, it's the threshold point. It's the places that we live, the places we interact. It's like homes in themselves, very private spaces. They can be beautiful, but it's like very much like experienced by a select few. Urban spaces are cool because it's how people engage socially yeah. and it's public space. Anything can happen, kind of. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, how do you make people feel safe? How do people feel social in social spaces? How do people feel connected? And it's a lot of really cool theories that kind of tie into the life generally. But um, I'm looking forward to once my stint with this research stuff that Swinburne's done is, is tying in that very human-focused design and thinking into the way I approach architecture and design generally. And I don't always think that architecture is the solution to any problem or urban design. I think that we've got to think first of the problem and the people and what they're going to use. And then the solution could be a system, a service. It could be a table, you know, not focused on the what, but more the why and the how and the where. And that's where the value lies. So, yeah. So many, so many things here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I heard a, a quote that if you don't have something, if something in your house isn't beautiful or useful, probably shouldn't be in there. Mm. 
you know, think about that from like urban design environment, like how we interact with the world outdoors. Like this is not, we're not in caves anymore with dirt and trees. We're living in a man-made environment mm. and you take for granted how that environment influences your mood, your behaviour, your efficiency. Mm. With what do you think? Like how does how, how should the average person like what do you see that the average person doesn't? I don't even know, like there's so many little things here. It's like how do you design the most beautiful and useful urban environment all in one? Mm. You can pick whatever one you want there. <laughs> it's a I guess it's a tough one. It's um it takes a team of people. It really does take a whole team of people to to really think about the outdoor space or the indoor space. I think something that I guess, um, you know, in terms of like, this is a big thing. And when I say this, everyone who does urban design is going to be like, yeah, classic. But it's a thing that I really like. It's this whole thing of passive surveillance. So um, Jan, Jan Gell did this great research on passive surveillance. And that's basically this theory of eyes in the street. So when you've got, say, I don't know, think of somewhere like, somewhere that's quite active all, at all hours of the night, Chapel Street. Uh, Paran, South Era, you know, there's always street frontages. There's always something happening happening on that, you know, street facing part of the amenities or the the, um, the buildings at the bottom, and whether it's a bar or a cafe or a club. And granted, not all the time safe things are happening. People are vomiting. They're spilling out of the clubs onto the streets. But guaranteed, if you're walking down there at like 3 a.m. on a Saturday night. Yes, there's a good mix of dodgy and kind of like uncertain kind of people that you might walk around, but there's also going to be um, security guards outside a lot of the places. There's going to be people looking and seeing things, taking photos, videos, whatever it is. And you're going to be safer in a place where there's something happening, say, 24-7 than in a place that's, uh, say, very suburban, just residential, Mm. where there's not much happening. Because when there's no one watching, that's when things happen. That's when things feel unsafe. Um, And when there's a lack of lighting... But it's more so when there's a lack of people. So people and people surveillance, um, eyes in the street, contribute to a more safer feeling environment. It might feel safer, things might still happen. You know, we can't avoid everything, but it might. It does definitely feel safer. And, um, you know, then you have things like lighting and street lighting and sounds and music or whatever it might be that can then add to that. But, you know, so when walking around, I notice if there's like a lot of activity at night time, and um, I think there's cities around the world who've tried this whole 24-hour city style thing where there's always something going on. And that has proven to show that you know, people feel safer at all hours of the night. And um, there's somewhere to go if someone needs to go somewhere to, to ask for help or whatever it is. So that's something I do notice in, turn, in certain areas. And there is actually XYX, I think it's called, from Monash Uni. They did a, a survey to ask people where they feel safest and where they feel most unsafe in Melbourne. And you can look at a map. It's like a data map online what's it called um i'm pretty sure it's xyx melbourne monash university street safety something i could be getting xyx or xxy something like that okay go on have a look to see if that's the one and what did they say what did they find well it's just um it's interesting to see where people safe feel safe and unsafe and then you can kind of compare it to what the theory says around where people generally feel safe and see if it's true so I think uh, based off what I saw, it's like a lot of time people feel safer in well-lit, popular, um, public spaces where there's a lot Makes of sense. people. And then there's like the dodgy kind of alleyways or like the train, uh, a lot of time around public transport, train stations, people feel unsafe. There's a lot of loitering, um, which is why we have, you know, uh, what's it called? Police officers yeah. who, who, you know, stand on the platforms at all times kind of thing, or at most times. Um, tra- when there's loitering, when there's a lot of waiting around, lack of movement, there tends to be a feeling of not like not feeling as safe unease yeah and it happens like um it's interesting in terms of forms of transport like whenever there's a bus interchange and people can loiter usually it doesn't feel as safe um but when there's constant flow and movement it feels really uppity and go it's like if you're loitering in a place that's moving a lot you look sus if you're loitering in a place where everyone's loitering, you don't look as sus, but you, things might still happen. So it's um, it's easier to identify someone who's looking like they're going to cause trouble in a, in a room full of bustling people than it is to if everyone was just standing still on their phones. Right, if they all look the same. Yeah, yeah. Is there something that when you walk around – actually, I wonder if this is 
Oh, that's not it. When you when you walk around the world, if you could like make, wave a magic wand and change how we all interact with the environment or our urban design, what would you change? What would I change? I, I think it's more what could what could we change about and probably not so much about what people could change about themselves. I feel like a lot of the time the environment is what is not um, enabling enough. So I, I, like a lot of the time. It's this whole theory of like there's actually this book called Mismatched and it talks about – it's more talks about how we don't include enough types of people in our, in our environments or in our designs. And in the sense of um, instead of saying uh, this person has a certain disability, therefore they don't fit in this environment, we say, well, actually, this environment doesn't fit the person. This mm. environment was de- designed 20, 30 years ago when we weren't very – informed designers the environment needs to change okay so what does that include well tactile indicators which are the little bumpy things on pa- on pavements we need to have those specific points so see people who are from the blind or visually impaired community can access and, and walk around and enjoy the space and be safe you know what does an inclusive environment mean it means more lighting for people to feel safe for example um, it also means having more wombat crossings which is when like there's a leveled kind of crossing across from like the the road to the pavement there is points where a wheelchair can go across quite smoothly um so it's more about what can we do for our environment to include more people i think that's what i would change and um it's it's very nice of you yeah it's no a, seriously it's, it's like a kind that comes from kindness not from like some like selfish oh i would make every building look a little bit more beautiful <laughs> yeah yeah and you know people love to look at pretty buildings that's for sure and there's always going to be room for that in the way we build our environments and the way we design there's always going to be room for making things beautiful um and it really depends on your theory of what beauty is too what is your definition of beauty for me personally it's uh if something is easy on the eye where but has points of interest so it's something that you can take in quite calmly but then become intrigued with a small detail or intrigued with a color or a function then it's like, that's huh. nice. Do you think that's the also partly the function or, 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 or a consequence of makeup? In a way. Like it, in, it draws attention to certain areas absolutely. That, that drive curiosity? Yeah, curiosity is, I think, a, a key part of beauty. I think we, we, th- we find things beautiful that spike our curiosity. Yeah. We become interested. So that, that's why beauty is very subjective because everyone finds different things interesting. Mm. And... Um, that's, yeah, I'd say that's the same thing with buildings. An interesting building with a cool curve or like a cool like corner, like a, a window or glass that just matches up seamlessly or whether it's a beautiful like precast concrete with a cool timber kind of molding on it or whatever it was, like that's the stuff where it's like, oh, that's very cool. And like, overall the building's like nice, but that's, that's very nice. What's the most beautiful, stunning city that you've ever visited? It would have to be – I mean, I, I do love the ancient architecture, like the more classical styles. So Florence, I think, was really beautiful. Also, Basel in Switzerland. Looked like a Christmas town. Basel? Basel. B-A-S-E-L. What's a lot of um, really beautiful architecture buildings there too. It's um, And those are very, like, classically be- – I'd say, you know, architecturally classically beautiful buildings. There's a lot of effort in the details. Um, oh, it's got a big old river down through it? Yes, it does. I've walked across the bridge there and it was very cold. <laughs> it looks like it's got like a... It's, it's very like, cute. Is that a castle? Was that a church? Yeah, it's just... It's got all these really cool... I remember going to this like little alleyway at one point between these buildings and there was a wishing well and it just... No one was taking care of this space. It just had a sign saying, throw a coin, pay pay for a postcard. So you'd pay like a little coin. It just trusts that you put a coin in. The person there just trusted that that would happen. So you put, of course, it's Switzerland. It's like, it's all very lovely. And um, so you put a coin in to get the postcard. And then I think it was like, what did you throw? Sorry, you know, you threw a coin into the fountain, the well, to make a wish. And then because you did that, you could get a postcard. I, did, I made like six wishes because the postcards are really pretty. <laughs> so I just kept, I'm like, another wish. Give more coins. I, I'm going to make another wish. <laughs> it was really nice. Um, but it's, um, you know, I, I find the... Attention to detail in this type of architecture, the colour. Yeah. Um, the attention to detail is what I find fascinating because I just think of the people who designed these buildings, who made them, like the builders and the architects. Maybe they didn't all have architects, but the builders. 
to, to sit there and make each thing as detailed as it is blows my mind. <sighs> what does it take to design... Like, what does it take as a human being to be able to design and create beautiful, useful architecture that is remembered and becomes iconic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, if you look at like, if you look at, we call them star architects or star architects, so very well-known architects who have done some fantastic buildings, a lot of the time, I don't know if I'm thinking, I'm thinking now of like Zaha Hadid, who was an amazing architect, um, you know, her style was very different for its time. Like her, she was a very, like a pioneer of this organic, very like bio, she, like, you know, she mimicking like, like biology. The yeah, exactly. That's it. It looks like the future. And I think people are fascinated by that. She was going to design this in Melbourne. In Melbourne? What is it? Skyscraper? So Melbourne skyscraper she left behind. I can't even, just, for those just listening, <laughs> I cannot begin to even describe this. Can you describe this with your language? I don't even know what words to use. What shape is that? So I'd say a lot of her architecture and her designs. It's like a fish. It is like a bit like a fish. It's very organic. And we would call this a lot of the time parametric architecture. Parametric. So it's, a par- parametric design is, is essentially oh, like that. algorithms that allow these things to like you you implement like code mm. and algorithms to allow for repeating patterns in a 3d software when you're designing or um something that creates like a, a component or um an, a building envelope that is adaptable to the form in the software um and it means like things like the sizes and the shapes of of each say panel on the cladding can be calculated automatically because it's like this kind of <sighs> adaptable system it's pretty complex but she does amazing things and um how much you get paid how much how much does an architect like they get paid to like design this? Oh, yes, a lot. <laughs> but if you're if you're starting out as an architect it's not it's not too crash hot but no but what, what do you know like seven figures eight figures like is this like an mba contract what are we talking <laughs> it would be up there it would be like i mean sometimes people pay like say your average local council architect you know for, for architecture plans of say a house it could be like I don't know, fifty grand to a hundred grand, For which is like a like a pretty like a nicely designed home, say. Huh. Like uh, I think that's like you know, let's say pretty average residential, right? Huh. This kind of thing would be ridiculous. I, I couldn't even fathom. I am not at that level. <laughs> not yet. I'm gonna get you back on when you are. Uh, we'll, we'll see. And I'm gonna ask you. <laughs> and just I can't tell you. Oh, no, I don't want to know that. I want to know how much does does Zaha Hadid make? Oh well, she well she passed away. She passed away at the age of uh, oh. fifty something. I think it was or maybe it was in her sixties. I think it was mid fifties. Damn. But um, which was very very sad. Um, also she was a pioneer for female, like architect. Uh, Is it a male dominated? Oh yeah. Yeah. Very male dominated. Not like it's actually interesting. My in my master's course there was more women, more females than males, which was very different. Um. But it is more male dominated, but that's changing very much. Like yeah. it's um used to be. Like you'd see old photos. If you look up old photos of architecture firms, black and white photos of architecture firms, it's all men on drafting tables. It's right. Funny. What's another another like superstar architect um, to look up? Well, I really like Herzog and Demuron, and a lot of their stuff was in. I'm gonna Barcelona. try and spell that. Yeah. See how you go. Herzogen. Is that a Herzog, ice cream? Herzog and Demuron. So, there we go. Oh, there we go. Thank <laughs> you, Google. <laughs> yeah, their stuff's really cool. I just, yeah, so that, that swirly, like that void. Yeah, that's that's crazy. But the one. This one? Oh, that one. Oh, that you, that oh. one was in Basel and I took a photo of it on the inside and they had a Christmas tree growing through the centre. Wow. Okay. It's, um, yeah. Looking at like a giant cylinder with, what, what do you call that texture? It's like, uh, what's it called? Just like a triangular. Oh no, it's like a woven facade in a way. Un- like underneath, this looks like a triangle, but it actually looks like it's woven, like a basket weaving. That's why I get you to describe them. these things. That's a very <laughs> much better description. <laughs> they do really cool things. I think I, I really like their ability to layer. That if you like a lot, a lot of their buildings, like that one, they do a lot of like layering and offsetting. Of I've shapes. seen something like this in Melbourne. There's like an apartment building in the Pean Highway that's like this. Yeah, is that the it's one? Like colors. The it's colorful like, like blocks. Yeah. Shipping container. It's like, looking. isn't that going to fall over? I know. It's like, no, it's people very live scary. there. And when that first got made, the one that one that you're talking about, everyone was like, oh, it's like ugly, but it's become a bit of an icon. Sometimes people, like, sometimes, yeah, it's because it's interesting. Yeah. People are curious about it. Stands out. It's it like, you can't out. help but stare at it every single time. Even if you hate it, <laughs> That's <laughs> you, right. you have to look at it. It's, um, 
they also did yeah this um yeah cool building at this this place called the Vitra campus in Wolfs no not Wolfsburg it's somewhere on the between Germany and Switzerland so look what does it take to get to get this is it a skill like can you get here based off skill or is it also like some genetic just born to be an incredible architect and think this way it's uh, i think it's um if you want to be like very original and make a mark and things like that it requires guts i think it takes a lot of guts to do things differently especially when it comes to buildings people live in buildings and their lives are at stake for what you design the building could collapse if you don't design it well it's true Obviously, has that ever happened like recently I, i'd say it's like some like some happened. crazy architecture right yeah and then it just collapsed because it's like built too wild yeah it's, it's like, <laughs> well there's that whole thing with um you know the, the cladding that was flammable in melbourne and they had to do a recall on it it's like the australian standards did a full well that's not audit. good it's bad yeah it's all done it's all dealt with now i think but so sometimes products are designed without testing enough against fire ratings, and but I think in terms of designing like like this level, yeah, you know, this uh, someone thinking of this type of architecture would have been great probably at you know strategic, you know business development, you know people management. I think it comes down to an ability to not only think differently and come up with wacky crazy designs that haven't been really done before. Um, it's like that's one thing to be able to think of original content. The other thing is to kind of – oh, I was going to say. Um, so having the guts to do it is one thing. I think also um, realising you have to have the discipline too. That's what I was looking for before, discipline. There we go. <laughs> Love that word. <laughs> so the discipline to realise like to get there, you might have the idea but you actually need to develop your skills. So it, And that's that long-term gratification. You're not going to be able to – say, rarely design something like that with the amount of money that will take without having a good few years of experience behind you of doing things that slowly make their way up to that scale. Yeah. Um, there have been some architects that have started kind of straight off the bat designing big things like that, but they're usually working with a partner where they can brainstorm. Um, they may have had already, uh, I don't know, some people can make it work, but it is risky. Um, and I think as well, I don't know, with, with becoming that kind of level, it takes a lot of determination and architecture is a lot of hard work and to even just finish my master's was wild. I can't imagine, you know, doing something like that. I have to interrupt you here because uh, to this day still, what I remember when we met, to, to give you a compliment here, is I still remember you being one of the hardest, most, the word tenacious comes to mind. Like you, you, you were tenacious. You, you always somehow kept a smile on your face. Maybe that didn't always appear behind the scenes, mm. but you would, the way you would describe and just that you could, I could see an insight into your life. And when I did, I'm like, wow, she works really hard and she just keeps going at it. Like she's very consistent. She seems like she's on a mission and she's not going to stop mm. until she's like complete the mission. It's like, I'm like, yeah, that's probably what this requires mm. to be great at this. You mentioned before as well, like obsession. Yeah. You have to be a bit obsessed. Is that you? You have to be, yeah. You're a bit crazy? When it comes, well, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to, I think when it comes to discipline and when it comes to doing, make trying to make an impact, let's say, trying to make an impact on people's lives, trying to leave something good behind, you have to be a bit mad because it means you're doing something very differently. Yeah. And you've got to be a bit mad to, to not take the path that it's safe. It's like someone says, hey, like you could do this and that's really safe and you'll you'll make some money and you can have a pretty good house. And you're like, um, what about this one? And it's like <laughs> like floods and it's dangerous. Earthquakes. It's like horrible. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The and dangerous it, path. It's it's the danger and it's like an informed danger. Like you're doing it knowing that you have the skills to navigate it. It's like there's gonna again, there's gonna be a lot a lot of un, uncertainty in that journey, but you trust that you have the emotional bandwidth you have the mental clarity you have the um calmness to approach it and to tackle it and you have the right support team around you too i wouldn't have been able to get through all the uni things life things and whatnot if it wasn't for my family and if it mm. wasn't for those very close friends that you know haven't wavered they've always been around and there's only very very few to be honest and um like that are actually like like the in those moments they're like yeah i'm here and like that's cool that's good to know there's plenty of much you can do to help but it's good to know you're there and um, those are those are really important things. And 
it, I think, yeah, I guess it takes some tenacity and, you know, being around people makes me smile. It's like when I'm on my own and I'm doing my own thing, I'm like full stress sometimes. And I'm like, God, like, this is so hard. I'll just be like, I give up. And then I'll have a nap and wake up and I'm like, we keep going. And then I'll see my friends. I'll see people. I'll talk to people and be like, having good conversations like this. And that's why I'm always smiling when people see me because being around people makes me smile. And when I'm on my own, I just, I can still be positive and work through things and push myself. (laughs) But being around people makes me smile. So I've always noticed that about you. I'm like, is she a crazy person? (laughs) I'm joking. She's like is really she, happy. Is, it, is her face like frozen like this? Does she have Botox to keep her cheeks up? Because it's really weird. Is she like suppressing like some mad trauma just oh. to like, just compensate? <laughs> no, she's just happy to see Internally you. Internally screaming the entire time. That's right. No, it's um, no genuinely happy. And um, that's beautiful. And you know, obviously, there's people that I don't feel so good around, and I will just be like, hello, and I don't wish to further engage, but. So yes. if you ever meet Paris and she just says hello, you know she doesn't like you. If I say something, like, oh, hi. <laughs> when, they, when you go high pitched, oh. that's when you know. Why that's do we do that? That's a weird thing we do. It is. It's I a think tell it's, though. It's a tell. I think I, there's two types of times you go high pitched if I'm saying, oh, hi. Or it's really loud. If it's loud in the club, I will go higher pitch. Rather than get louder, my sister and I did the exact same thing. We'll just, our voices will go higher to just break through you got to you got to enter another frequency. Exactly. You almost like got to break glass with that <laughs> that that tone. It's the only way. <laughs> like this is my normal voice, and then if I'm in a club, it's like very high. I can't do it right now. <laughs> no. I'll play some loud music. <laughs> yeah, then you will hear it. You're like, oh god, <laughs> okay. sound like a chipmunk. <laughs> <laughs> is that a chipmunk or Paris? <laughs> can't tell. <laughs> okay. There's many many things that I would also like to talk about, but being conscious of your time. Mm. And you also wanted to talk about a few things, Mm. but is there anything on your mind right now that you wanted to bring up? Otherwise I'll just keep exploring the other curiosities I have. Um, I mean, I guess in, in terms of just like, we're just talking about, you know, it's, it's easy to say like, Oh, you just got to like work hard and push through shit and Mm. then you'll get there that's in practice really hard to do. And I think acknowledging the fact that to do that is hard just puts everyone else's minds at ease of like, oh, it's okay that I'm finding this thing that I'm doing right now really hard because it's meant to be hard. It's actually meant to feel like a bit of hard. When I say hard, I don't mean like it's so difficult. It's beyond your comprehension. Like uncomfortable? It's meant to be like you get up in the morning, like, damn, I had to wake up early to do this. Of course you did because if you want to do it, you have to wake up a little bit earlier to fit it in. Mm. It's like, oh, no, I had to – um. I had to have this two hour meeting and it was so, I was so tired, but I had to have it so we could come to this outcome. Of course you had to have that two hour meeting. How else are we going to get that outcome? So it's like acknowledging the fact that there are going to be moments when you're like, God, I would rather be like on the couch watching Netflix, which is also something I love doing. But I usually do it at three in the morning because I've spent the day trying to like Jeez, <laughs> get other shit done. I mean like <laughs> stage four of non-REM sleep. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, I'm, and, I, and I just want to, I guess, um, disclose that because yeah. I've, you know, I hear a lot of other talks where people are like, you just got to wake up every day and like work hard and then you get there. And that's the very surface level sugarcoating version. Yeah. Every step towards something that's long-term gratification, some parts of it, like you said, are awesome. And that's what keeps you going. And it's like little rewards along the way, little mini dopamines, but there's going to be moments where it's like, you're going to need to pick, like support from your family. You're going to need someone to go grab you that coffee because you're just so busy. Um, you're going to actually need to have a day where you just don't do anything and you feel like shit because you haven't done anything, but you need that. Your body, your brain needs it. It's hard and it will be hard, but you need to focus on the the why and celebrate the little, little wins. Okay. What's your why? Like why do this? Why work so long, so hard, so much, so consistently for so many years on architecture? Like why? My, my big why for most things I do, and it comes down to again, what I said before is, I want to connect with people. Like I see life as like one big conversation and it's the more people I can talk to and gauge perspectives of that can input into what gets designed or whatever it is, the more I can know about people's experiences and the more that maybe my influence from knowing those experiences can mean that something's designed that they're going to really enjoy using. That's that's the why. And I don't even have to do design. It could just be like... Yeah. If someone's having a hard time and through conversation they can feel a little more seen, that's awesome. And 
you know, that's the same with design. It's like through talking with me, hopefully people can be like, she gets me. She knows what I actually need and want. I haven't felt that in a while because everyone else just doesn't understand. And I think um, we could all do much better in this life if we make sure that in conversation with others, we work towards making them feel seen and heard and making them, when I say seen, it's like making them realise that they exist and that's important. We can all aim for that goal in any interaction we have professionally and personally. I don't know. I feel like it's life becomes more meaningful that way. If we can make people feel seen, mm. how do we make people feel seen? I think it's just through really listening and not putting our own perspective onto them. Ah. And I think realising like they might actually um, tell us something that goes really against things that we thought previously were true. Sure. But then being like, you know, that's a really, really good point. Or, you know, I, just listening. And then if they can be like, oh, at the end, like, you know, I felt comfortable talking to you. I really felt welcomed. That's a nice thing. And, and yeah, I don't know. That, that's how I see value in how I go by my day, my day today. If I've had good conversations with people and they've felt heard, then, and then that's, that's a good day. I think that's so interesting that you ended up in architecture when, like, that could be a vehicle for that outlet. Right, of course, there's connection and community mm. there, but I wonder if there is something else mm. that could connect you even deeper to that value set that you have about connection with other people. Mm. Do you wonder that? Well, that's why because architecture. I, I'm sorry, you, yeah. architecture. You just sit. You can theoretically just. It can be a lonely thing. Absolutely, yeah. So, it can be very lonely. Well, that's that's the reason reconcile why. Reconcile that. That's why I'm doing the thing I'm doing now because it's all about people, what okay. I'm doing now. Yeah, it's yeah, all about people. It's yeah. all about people's experiences. And um, going into – that's why I do my own freelance too because when I'm talking to someone who wants something designed, not that it's been happening heaps because I've been busy with the job that I have, mm. but whenever I do, um, when I'm talking to them, sometimes we're just talking about things that we're really interested in. We're having good back and forth. And then they will talk more about how something gets used. They'll open up more. And that's a big thing of like if you're wanting to design something for someone or do anything for someone, you can't just do it based off assumption alone or off what they initially tell you in the first five minutes because it's usually a very filtered down or, or biased perspective or um, scared of being open about what the real problem is. Once you engage in a good back and forth and you develop a comfortable, safe environment through language, through body language, through where you are physically, the setting, then you might be able to get some really honest answers out there. And I really enjoy honest conversation and I enjoy I, – I like to make people feel like they can be honest with me and that then I'm going to do something or design something that is in line with that honesty. And um, it doesn't matter what I'm designing. It could be a house. It could be a table. It could be um, an application. It could be a robot. I don't know. A it's robot. All, it's all fun. It's really awesome. It's more about like the the why, the the what the person actually wants, right. and then the design's irrelevant. So that's why I enjoy designing because it's like the value comes from the conversations you're having having with the Let's person, see. and I feel like I'm pretty good at eventually getting to what the real problem is with people. That is so interesting that you value the conversation the most. I. Don't imagine that's a very common priority for designers and architects. Mm. But then I think when we're talking on the phone, you mentioned the utility of conversation being to, like, we need conversation and connection to find answers. Mm. Is that what you said? Yeah. It sounds like something I would say. I think so, I didn't say that. <laughs> can you elaborate? Because it, like, yeah, can do you remember that thought? Mm. I'd say, like, it's, I mean, it's very similar to, like, you know, what we're saying now as well, which is, I mean, yeah, well, actually I do remember what I said then, it's like, you know, what well, comes back to what I said before too of like I think having convers uh, life is a big conversation yeah. and the, the ability to talk in a language and speak and understand is something that we've developed over, you know, thousands and thousands of years and it's so that we can understand each other more because we wanted to. And, you know, actually I was having a conversation yesterday with a friend and we were saying, wouldn't it be cool if there was just – we've got, like, the phonetic alphabet, but wouldn't it be cool if we all understood it so well that we could all communicate of one common language? The one common language we all have is, like, body language, music, mathematics, 
maybe some science in mm. there that we understand all the same. Um, but in terms of language day to day, the level of productivity we would reach if we all also had a language we all spoke um, would be wild. And, you know, uh, sign language is one of those. We have Auslan, but there's also some variations in how that is. Sign language is in other countries too, but that's maybe a bit more consistent. Um, Interesting. It's, but if we had a consistent language, the, the productivity would increase by heaps. Well, what we're going to see, very likely, probably within our lifetime, is some version of what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink. Have you heard of this? Mm. Putting um, microchips in people's brains to restore uh, bodily function uh, from people who are like paraplegic, spinal cord, um, serious, serious injuries, and basically can... You ha- you're like the internet. You're download. You can only download a certain amount of data at one time, hundred megabytes per second. Neuralink's metaphor is like we're going to increase the bandwidth of how much information we can mm-hmm. intake. A- and he said that we'll get to a point where you won't have to talk. Like that's kind of hi- part of his vision. You won't have to yeah. talk because you'll be able to convey thoughts mm-hmm. via thinking. So I'll be able to s- read what you're thinking. You have to read with my thinking, and mm-hmm. that makes me think. Well, then I wonder if there's some type of translation in there where. Mm-hmm. Yeah, productivity will very likely increase dramatically if I can understand what you're thinking without needing a a uh, the, the the spoken word the spoken word and any translation. Mm, mm. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's a really interesting future to think of, and I think there's. I wonder. I wonder what difference it will make in interaction if we are not moving our mouths and talking. Huh. I wonder what impact moving our mouths has on how we take things in. And Yeah, because I can see yeah. your eyes are expressive, you mm. smile. Like, what if I'm just like... <laughs> exactly. It, but then it's like, hmm. does the expression get effectively translated, say, through through wavelengths oh, wow. in brain, like in that brain communication? In those wavelengths, like, does that actually get... That's a good question. Does the expression get carried I'll through? I'll call Elon later. Yeah, <laughs> I'll call him like, hey, like, what are you going to do about expression and, uh, <laughs> like, the way we emphasize things? It's a good emphasis. question. Yeah, it's, it's, I think, I think it, that, that's the the way that our minds can, you know, I'm doing this when I'm talking. I don't know why. For some reason, that feels like the right thing to do. Probably, it's probably a Greek yeah. thing. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> we, all, we love using our hands for, to say everything. <laughs> but... um. It's a, uh, what's it called? It's a, is it symbiotic? Symbiotic movement um, between like your voice and then your hands. It just, it happens without me even thinking. Oh, right. So yeah, I, think, I think it's synchronized, synchronized. Symbiotic means back and forth, I think. Uh, probably getting it very wrong. Um, but I think it is. But no, so, you know, if we're just thinking through our minds and we're not moving our mouths, does that mean we're not moving our hands either? Or are we doing this and then we're like, that would be very strange. <laughs> very look strange. Like a mind, right? <laughs> very strange. Man, I it's wonder if we'll be the old people, like our parents in some ways, where we'll be casting and judging the new technology. Remember back in my day, we had mobile phones yeah. and we would talk to they each other. They were fine. You didn't need to fix mobile phones. They were fine. <laughs> and now they're in our brains. Yeah, how weird. And that's actually a big thing. I think, um, again, it's a fine balance, but we've got to be like, open to new technologies and the fact that people are going to be doing things differently. It comes back to the control thing. We can't control, we can't freeze time to be in a point where we're comfortable with it and be like, this is my comfort time and that's just how it's going to stay forever because everyone else is going to feel comfortable at different times. So you need to move with the times and I think constantly, as, as best as you can, um, be like up to date with how the world's working, both technologically, socially, things like that. I wonder if when it gets out of hand, when there's a tipping point and we bec- we lose control of the systems that we've created. Like mm. in some ways, some people may argue we've lost control of social media. Mm. Like, that, yeah, there are people who own it, but now it's become this big, giant, multi-billion um, person thing where, you know, a lot of young children are being affected. But at the same time, we can connect like that in a moment mm. and people can listen to this podcast from across the world. Mm-hmm. And so, and then it's like, oh, what happens when... What happens when artificial intelligence becomes a predominant uh, force in our society that we interact with? Mm. Is there a tipping point there when that becomes out of control and that could be detrimental to uh, humanity's survival? Mm. It's um, and I think it's you know you raise really good points and it's super valuable to think about the dystopic outcomes, which is like, you know, there's value in thinking about worst case scenario good to think about it it's also good to think about best case scenario 
and think about what are the possibilities and you you weigh those two things against each other and you yeah. see is this worthwhile and if we do it well we know what potentially the worst case could be who do we employ or who do we engage with to manage that risk and is it is are the positives worth the risk is it worth the potential of someone hacking a system and you know shutting down all the automatic cars in a freeway and causing crashes well yeah it's worth it because we what, what we're avoiding is people who fall asleep at the wheel people sure. who are inebriated whilst they're driving people who can't drive very well um we're reducing traffic congestion so there's a lot of pros and then the, the odd chance that that happens it's really horrible if it does happen it's pretty catastrophic so what are we going to do what services will we bring in to manage that risk mm. and um thinking about well a lot of what i do as well is thinking about worst case scenario and then thinking about best case and then thinking about neutral case you know what's the like incremental thing that could change and then what's the big on the one end of the spectrum the big good thing the big bad thing and then managing those risks and knowing if something's worth doing but you got to look at both sides you have to look at both sides you can't be like full like oh it's all fantastic or you can't be like oh it's all bad yeah you can't nothing's be ever all any any time there's, there's a lot always, of gray there's a lot of gray yeah you can't be like a blind cynicist or optimist no exactly huh. neither of those extremes are going to do you any good you're either going to be severely let down <laughs> and like nothing will work out because you're being idealistic yeah or you're being way too pessimistic where you will never do anything because you just think nothing's worthwhile or trying. experience any joy or in the world as perhaps as well no, yeah. And see, see good. Mm. Mm. We'll finish. Probably the last thing I wonder for any designers, architects, or even just like as a thought experiment for yourself, mm. is there advice you wish you had or you would – you know what? You're a lecturer. <laughs> you get the chance. Mm. I don't know who exactly you lecture, but let's say you get to lecture all new year two mm -hmm. students doing your undergrad – what advice do you give them and or yourself, a younger mm. version? Oh, this is a good question. And I think um, I feel like the advice I would give is I think, yeah, I feel like a big thing is like what I've talked about is that why. I would ask them with any project they're about to do, you know, what, what are you hoping, you know, I'd say think about things in the perspective of who you're designing for and think – as much as possible about the human at the end of that story. Um, don't get too caught up in how cool does my building look or, um, you know, competing against other students. Com competition's great. Healthy competition's great. It allows you to benchmark and keep doing better. But don't think of just your designs that you do in architecture school as like, I just want to be better than this person. Because you keep doing that for your whole degree. You get to the end, you're like, well, I did projects that were better than that person. But did I do anything that really means something? Sure. And... Um, can guarantee if you think about the person who you're designing for first or the people, we'll call them the user groups that you're designing for, and if you can get your hands on some of those user groups and ask them questions about what they wish their space had, what they are frustrated with, what they what their ideal building would look like if they could design it themselves, if you have those conversations with them and use that to inform what you do, I'm telling you right now, you're going to get a fantastic response from your tutors because they love that shit. And you're also going to learn more about design because if you're not designing for people, if you're not thinking of the person first and foremost, yeah. what are you designing for? Yeah. To create a landmark so that you can look cool and be famous? That's cool. You can do that if you want but to. How many of them make but, it? Well, that's the thing. And, and sometimes a lot of the time they do and people oh, design. Really? Oh, you see some like things designing. Like, that's clearly just like, you know, this big thing. It's like, <laughs> it's like what's it called? It's like having, you know, like a really nice car that doesn't do much. Right. It's, like, it's just like it looks nice. But th there is examples of that too and and um, I would hope that future generations, including my own, um, will approach design and architecture as much as possible from a human-centred lens. And, you know, it's kind of like going to the gym. Like the process and the learnings that you have throughout that, that's what keeps you going. And it's um, uncomfortable sometimes and it's tough yeah. and it challenges your initial perceptions, but that's what's worth doing. And with designing for people and really thinking about the person they will challenge your perceptions as a designer suddenly you think oh i always thought that was what would look good but this person's telling me that that's not how they actually use it that's really game changing for me because i had a whole other plan but take that time as a moment for growth and an opportunity to design something great 
And something great is something useful and something that means something to someone where they're going to make their memories and they're going to feel fantastic in it. So you've got to think of the person. And I don't think that's done enough. And I would I would say that's the key thing. And know that architecture is not always a solution. Sometimes as an architect, you will design something else that works as well. You're a designer. You're an artist. Mm. You're there to create and you're there to respond to something. You're responding to some kind of challenge and don't be too fixated on it. It has to be a pavilion. It has to be um, a house. It can be something else too. And um, not getting too caught up in the the visual thing at the end. That why is going to make your concept so much better. That's what I'd say. That's a, I, I, that's a beautiful way to finish. And I think that's, that transcends industries. Thinking of the person first mm. and the why. Mm-hmm. Any last thoughts? Any last thoughts? Asks of the people listening, or just if you want to send them anywhere. Um, buy my ebook. <laughs> buy my ebook. I don't have one. Maybe one day. Um, I'd say read the book Mismatch. It's good. It's a black and white hardcover. It's a black and white book. I think you can get it from Audible. Um, but also, uh, just quickly to wrap up on what you said too. A lot of the time, people will say. Oh, but designing for humans, talking to people is expensive. It takes up time. You will – and it will end up costing you more afterwards if you don't talk mm. to the right people first because you will make assumptions that are going to cost you millions in an industry context. If you just take the time to talk to people about what they actually want and need, um, you're going to save yourself so much money later on when before you put something yeah. out there that's going to fail because you haven't talked to anyone. You've just gone off your assumptions and some quick research on the internet. Talk to people, invest time in people, and then you will save so much later on. Time and money. So when people are focused on that part, that's my argument against it. And in practice, that works. You save so much afterwards. That's great. That's what I'd say to rebut that. If anyone's thinking that, that's what I would say. Tell them. Yeah, that's it. I'm telling them. It's, like, <laughs> it's actually, you can do it. You can have both. You can talk yeah. to people and get something great. Right. Yeah. Thank you, And Paris. save money. <laughs> Yeah, but all three. All three things. It's just love fantastic. That. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on this and, and talking to you is, is awesome. All, You're welcome. All I really enjoy this. If this so we, should, we should do this again one 100%. day. 100%. Done. <laughs> Done. Thank Done. you, Paris. Thanks, Alex. <laughs>